Greetings, everyone. Um, the folks on the margins there, if where us, as may be appropriate for this discussion, come into the center. Um, yeah, there's some, some seats at the table. This is uh, seminar-like, which is good. It's appropriate. Um, we can have a nice discussion here. So um, my name is Eric Zoloff. I teach history at Stony Brook University. I'm the director of the Latin American Caribbean Studies Center there at Stony Brook. And um, uh, I'm also one of the co-organizers of the Mexican Studies Group at the Builder Center, along with um, Araceli Tinajero, who is on leave, I believe, this semester or this year. So um, we put on, or helped to organize, um, a few such Mexican-oriented events each year. And um, so thank you for coming out. Um, Today, I'm very happy to have two young scholars whose work focuses on different aspects of urban Mexico. Um, David Yee, who is um, a student at Stony Brook University, um, just uh, completed his coursework and all that, and is about to head into uh, full thrust into the field, as we say, um, to Mexico, and has already begun doing uh, dissertation work there. Um, looking uh, to historicize um, Mexican ur urban Mexico City and, and uh, popular public housing in Mexico, um, and David Lopez here um, at the New School, which is hereabouts, um, who is I, I'm not 100 percent sure, maybe um, back from the field and, and writing at this no. point, or also about to go second year, second year. Okay, okay. swinging courses. Okay, so <laughs> full swing. Um, uh, but very immersed um, in uh, doing research on um, contemporary aspects of urban planning, um, public policy, and will be able to give us more of a kind of contemporary focus. So I think it would be nice to have this kind of balance between the historical and the contemporary and to get uh, a perspective and a conversation going um, on, on the significance of urban history and urban public policy in this particular site, Mexico City, but we can um, perhaps extrapolate and talk about the urban experience more broadly um, as we gain some insights from, from this discussion. So, it, you know, it, just trying to set this conversation up, um, for, for a long time there were sort of two dominant you know, narratives that were in tension with one another um, regarding the study of urban Latin America and Mexico City was very prominent within that, those, those narratives. On, on the one hand, we had this idea of the, the urban underclasses, right? Often they're called the, the dangerous classes, the plebe, right? The folks in which, for the, for, from the elite's perspective, from foreigners' perspectives, were considered um, subversive classes, the rabble, um, anti-democratic, the, the site of, of anti-democracy, the, the absence of civilized order um, and notions of progress. Uh, uh, the folks that would pose a threat to efforts by the elites to construct an ordered body politic. And sort of at the other end of the you know, spectrum, if you will, uh, were the elite modernizing forces who uh, turned to Europe in particular, Western Europe, and later towards the United States, more in the perhaps 20th century, uh, to emulate not only sort of the sort of gestures, if you will, that the pose of modernity, but quite literally the architectural styles of the modern, and to import, in many regards, sort of whole cloth, um, those architectural aspects, with the assumption that um, through architecture comes um, social social policies and, and order. And, and it was an, an effort to both um, to move away from perhaps those rabble rousing plebe classes and construct a sort of an other order, uh, an, an internal city within the city that could be held up um, both for uh, domestic elites and in the eyes of foreign investors in particular as uh, symbols of the aspirations of progress. So 
today, if we think about, you know, where, where's our, where the narratives, right, of, of modern, thinking about the urban, the modern, um, in, in Latin America and Mexico in particular, um, you know, many regards, maybe, maybe those images, those discourses, narratives have some staying powder, power in, in the media and certain sort of popular notions of where lies danger and where lies the modern. But, you know, when we look at it through the lenses of, of uh, social science and public policy, we, we recognize how they really um, do not hold water uh, at all. And we have to, they, they, instead, we find um, a, a complete reconfiguration in many regards um, of those dominant narratives. So for, for instance, when we think about the margins, uh, whether it's the you know the favelas in, in Brazil or the ciudad, so-called you know ciudades perdidas, the afueras, right in, in places like Mexico City, um, rather than sites of, of disorder and subversiveness, um, rabble the rabble we see them as very innovative sites of, of citizenship making um, and of um, efforts, uh, creative efforts in artistic sense, in, this, in the sense of uh, um, of claiming space within the body politic um, and sites of, uh, of creative um, democratic innovation, participation. Um, and then on the other hand, the idea of the modern, I think, has been very much reframed, reconsidered as well. So no longer do we, when we look at places like Mexico City, do we see simply um, a replica of, you know, the modern elsewhere, but instead we see wholly original constructs of what modern architecture and the organization of public space um, means and is about. And we have a, indeed, in fact, rather than, you know, say Mexican architectural uh, elites and others, you know, looking outward, it's in many ways the opposite, right? We can now learn lessons from um, the ways in which uh, urban planners in places like Mexico City or, or Bogota or, or Santiago or elsewhere um, use architecture and the relationship, think about architecture and public space um, as a way of um, consolidating democracy, opening up new pathways for, for citizenship. Um, in, in many ways, there, there are many lessons to be learned. And I think some of it we'll, we'll hear today in terms of the uh, innovations that Mexico City planners have, have been doing. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that on the table as a way for us to think about how um, or have us think about how we think of place, a place like Mexico City and the idea of the urban and, and how we um, perhaps carry certain uh, a kind of discursive baggage, right? That, that these series of sort of negative associations, it's like, that, you know, we mentioned urban Mexico City, the assumption is, ah, collapse, decay, decay banditry, danger, da, da, da. You know, and I, and I think a lot of that sort of, it, it gets channeled through the media representations. Um, and not that there isn't some truth or truism to that, certainly um, Mexico City's, in some ways, probably more dangerous now, or some aspects are more dangerous now than 20 years ago. Um, but at the same time, I think that that kind of baggage um, distorts and blinds us to realities, very creative art realities, both artistically and architecturally, and in terms of what an, an active, active, uh, activated citizen, citizenry means and looks like. Um, and I think we have to we have to keep all of that in mind as as we think about the urban. Okay, so um, without further ado, that was all I was going to say. Um, David D is going to first give us a, a short presentation. Um, I think each is maybe 15, 20 minutes, give or take, uh, of their research, and then we're going to kind of open it up, and we'll have a conversation about it and go from there. Okay, so David D is in the shadow of the metropolis, informal and public housing in Mexico City. Okay, thank you. Um, so with my time, I wanted to talk about the challenges posed by housing in Mexico City, um, beginning in the 1940s, uh, where we see a major population explosion, and I'll go into more, um, and ending uh, roughly in the 1970s. So uh, this was a transitional period of unprecedented internal mass migration and population growth in Mexico City. And it's in this period that I'm going to focus 
on the city's severe housing shortages, the proposed solution to these problems, and then the actual solutions that came about in this period of time. So if there's one phrase that really um, encapsulates or is most often used to describe uh, the housing situation in Mexico City in particular in this period after World War II, it is one of crisis. And um, whether you're reading from journalists, government officials, policymakers, um, or uh, ordinary citizens, people on the street, um, the notion of the housing crisis is a very pervasive idea. Now, um, the in hindsight, um, the one could be a bit skeptical about the idea of a crisis last 30 years, it's sort of a long gated period of time to have that kind of intensity. Um, but nonetheless, it, I think it does um, give a sense of how severe the problem was in Mexico as it entered this period of intense urbanization. So um, just to give you, I want to just give uh, people a basic background of the scenario in Mexico City in this period of time. Um, so we can see what the challenges that they were facing and how people approached um, housing, particularly popular housing or mass housing. Um, so as we see from the slide, Mexico City experienced this massive influx of migrants from the countryside at a level that would never be seen again. Going beyond the overall numbers, while a large number of these migrants were poor peasants who flooded into the city, um, this migration, and on such a large level, encapsulates a very diverse grouping of people from all over Mexico. So um, beyond how it's typically portrayed in terms of those that are incredibly impoverished, uh, we have people who have uh, been formally educated, live in small cities or towns throughout the country, and are also traveling into Mexico City. Um, and this is uh, very highly representative of the growing urban middle class that we're going to be um, seeing in this period of time. Um, so all this is to say that part of the challenges of providing housing for gro this growing metropolis was not solely for the large number of new arrivals living in extreme poverty, but also for this rising uh, middle class that was a crucial base of support for the PRI, which is the Mexican ruling party. Um, so. The, the, the actual housing deficit or shortage um, varies in numbers. It's in millions. And when I say that, it's housing that's deemed inadequate for uh, people to be living in unsafe conditions, deterioration. Um, but one particular aspect of it that sort of captures this is so we see this is the height of immigration in the United States with uh, four people sleeping in one room, the percentage of it in, in these major cities, northeast cities. Um, in Mexico City in 1960, you could say roughly 40% of the population lived in um, a dwelling that was just one room um, and with an average of five people. So this is, uh, we can get a sense of the incredible amount of overcrowding that is occurring in the city. Um, and so there's obviously a tremendous need for um, solutions and alleviations to this problem. Um, so, and this is, you know, also just quickly, these, these illustrations are to give you some sense of even how it's expressed in the news and the press and the media, this constant sense of chaoticness and crisis that's happening um, in, in Mexico City. Um, and then just to give you a sense of, of this growing number of, this is nationally, but um, it's, it's a little bit higher in terms of percentage-wise in Mexico City. Um, so after World War II, um, I'm sorry, while Mexico City stands out as a more extreme example, this was a global phenomenon after World War II where the slums and tenements of city centers were overwhelmed by migrants arriving from the countryside. After World War II, um, there was a larger ethos. I'm not going to go into it because it really is uh, a very broad topic, but um, a sense of urban renewal that was prevalent among urban planners, architects, and politicians that in regard to housing can be boiled down to two main components. Um, one is slum clearance. Uh, the second is the replacement of those demolished tenement buildings with large-scale housing projects that impose a planned and rational order on the urban landscape. 
Um, so these are just two quick examples, one from New York, one from Caracas, to give you a sense that um, this was occurring around the world in many major cities, and uh, the, the sense of urban renewal was definitely a predominant wave of discourse and talking about how to address these issues, right? Um, so in Mexico City, we see a distinct and in some ways exceptional example. In the main, we see very little plans of slum removal materialize. Where we see the demolition of housing, old housing stock is in the construction of roadways or with the notable exception of Talate Loco, which is here, okay? So, um, Talate Loco, this was really the only one major um, mega project that destroyed blocks of 19th century buildings that housed workers as part of a process of urban renewal. Um, it was pushed forward by its main designer, Mario Pani, and he would later go on to say, I, I just think this is a really um, kind of revealing quote, he says, I wanted to continue with more projects to expel all those who were living in the poor neighborhoods. I was planning five or six talate locos for 66,000 families. So that's not 66,000 people, 66,000 families. So there's a major destruction that he wanted to incur in the center of the city to build large-scale housing projects like this. Um, but this did not happen, and if we have more time, we can go into why it is that uh, this large-scale destruction and implementation of housing projects in the center of the city did not happen. Um, but what did occur is the construction of these large-scale public housing complexes that were uh, at a distance from the city center on open fields and lands that were expropriated by the Mexican government. So this outward urban sprawl of Mexico City, it was propelled by uh, two modes of urbanization. Um, the first mode is the uh, composed of government-built housing complexes and parks. The second was made up of informal settlements or shanty towns that varied in their legal status, but were generally characterized by their absence of services and infrastructure and were often built by the residents themselves. So I want to focus on two examples in their own right, and hopefully if we have time, go into how these are interlocked and interrelated in this period of time. Um, so uh, I want to talk about this. This is one example of many, but this is Unidad Independencia, um, and this was one of five public housing, proje uh, housing projects that were built by the Institute of Mexican Social Security, or EAMS, um, and during Lopez Mateo's presidency. It opened in 1960 on the southern periphery of the city, and the construction of this complex was representative of a broader campaign to solidify the ruling party's status, excuse me, as a legitimate defender of the Mexican Revolution, um, and in a, a period of time where this is in 1960, so we have a major railway strike that's occurring in Mexico. We have the Cuban Revolution that's occurring, and uh, with this, within this role, it adds a certain agency for the Mexican government to deliver on these promises of social welfare. And so, for the most part, 1,000 res residents who moved to this complex. Uh, moved from the center of the city, were part of the formal workforce, many of them teachers or civil servants, um, and went through a selective screening process. In the case of this uh, housing complex, there was 14,000 people who applied for a vacancy, and those who were qualified were visited by a social worker and interviewed as part of the application process. So in essence, this is a social filter. Um, and uh, what, what, is, what stands out as unique, we don't really have that much comparative studies uh, in relation to Latin America and the U.S. in terms of public housing projects, um, but when you say p the projects are public housing in the United States, it obviously has a, uh, a connotation that um, carries neglect, sometimes criminality, poverty. Uh, not the same case in Mexico. Um, we have uh, more of a case of these are public housing that is more dedicated to the lower middle class or middle class people who are part of many times uh, state level bureaucracy, things of this nature. Um, 
So at a time when there was a palpable discontent stemming from overcrowding and deteriorating housing conditions, subsidized housing projects for the middle class, or we could say la gente decente, were critical in maintaining their political support and projecting Mexico onto the world stage. So this is a, um, this is a poster that came along with um, the opening of the complex um, before in the newspaper, sort of championing the, the revolution, right? And sort of how this is part of the insurgency that's going on. Um, in terms of a world stage, this is uh, when John F. Kennedy visited the, the complex. Um, and it was part of him going to Mexico during the Alliance for Progress or trying to really expand that. Um, and this is, you know, an example of when um, visiting dignitaries and officials are coming to a city or coming to a country and you want to display uh, kind of social welfare programs that you're uh, bringing about. Bringing them to, you know, the headquarters on the fifth floor of a building is not that interesting, you know, in some office building, but bringing them to this large complex where you have people come out and uh, perform folkloric dance, whatever the case may be, this provides a certain spectacle and pushes out Mexico in a different way um, on the world scale. So um, the last thing I'll say about it is that um, the more than simply housing units, the public housing complexes here, such as Unidad Independencia, contain gardens, sports centers, pools, green spaces, and uh, even the zoo, right? So along with the immediate benefits for the residents, this form of planning represents an attempt at a synthesis between the natural and built environment. And this can be seen as a marker of social distinction when compared to Mexico, many of Mexico City's informal settlements that lack paved roads, parks, and were built in areas prone to flooding. The second mode of urbanization uh, that I want to talk about greatly outweighed public housing, and this came the most prominent and popular form of housing in Mexico City. By 1975, it was estimated that 65% of housing in Mexico City, or the Mex Mexico City metropolitan area, because at this point, the city expands beyond the, the formal boundaries of the, of the federal district, right? Um, even before that, but 65% um, of the housing in Mexico City area is deemed uh, colonias populares, or informal housing that we've been talking, or I've been talking about. Um, so these housing settlements were established in two ways. One was by land invasions or takeovers, where groups of people would take over a part of land and establish a settlement. Um, the second was when land developers sold fraudulent titles for land plots to poor families, often promising basic services like electricity and running water that, in fact, did not exist. Um, so the second scenario was virtually the, always the case in Ciudad Nezahualcoyotl, which is the, um, the second uh, place I want to focus on. So before it was that, it was um, a, a lake that was then drained out and created a massive desert. So just in terms of these numbers, we could see this explosive growth um, as many of the solutions to finding housing in, within the city proper itself continue to fail. Um, so um, can you go back a second? Sure. Um, so we could see. Even here, this, this jump from 60 to 1970 is, is incredible, and you won't see something like that again. Um, but it's within this rapid pace that opens up a lot of, unfortunately, uh, modes of exploitation. But as the, we see a larger concentration of people, um, more possibility for organizing groups of people to demand their housing rights. Uh, so this is. Uh, some of the first photos that we have of Ciudad Neza in the mid-1940s, late-1940s. Um, and this uh, gives you a sense of its sort of desolation um, as people started settling there, right? Um, so this is late-1940s, uh, and this is, um, I think this is in the early 2000s. But um, clearly we see this dramatic transformation in terms of what's going on there. Um, and so in the remaining time that I have, uh, one aspect that I would like to emphasize uh, in
Talking about Neza and, and sh shanty towns in general in Mexico, and one could argue more in, in Latin America, places like Peru, um, is that the, the government's direct and indirect role in the proliferation of these shanty towns. Many times it's portrayed as a, a place of lawlessness or statelessness. It's beyond the state and um, people are uh, operating under their own grid or, or something of that nature. Um, so with, with this particular example, people start beginning settling there in 1946. Um, and in 1953, this area, which is federally owned land, basically all of what you see here in this photo, um, was a subject to a presidential decree that stipulated the land and it should be converted to low-income housing. And so my point here is that the origins of NEZA are not um, spontaneous uh, takeovers under the radar uh, outside of the public purview, right? But this is something that is very much acknowledged within the government and it's seen as cheap land to alleviate the housing deficit in the capital. Um, the, the last thing is that, in general, there was a mixed and contradictory response from the government toward self-built housing settlements in Mexico City. On the one hand, uh, the settlements that were closer to the center of the city or closer to more middle class or wealthy subdivisions were repressed and evicted by uh, the police and state authorities and were generally stigmatized in the press. On the other hand, real estate developers were ultimately able to gain the unspoken consent of state officials to sell plots of land outside of proper legal channels. Now, in terms of the exact process of corruption and collusion, that's something I'm seeing if I can find in, in, in the research process, um, but it, it's clearly something that did occur. And um, in addition to that, one can find several studies, guides, even manuals published by the Mexican state's National Housing Institute that outlines how local officials can assist in self-building process that took place on the periphery. So um, at a certain point in the mid-1960s, uh, the government in a certain sense, not completely, but accepted the fact that these shanty towns were going to crop up and that um, the government could play a role in assisting them in providing materials to build their own homes. So in this sense, there's a sense of legitimating this process with the government being um, part of it. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and, and we could continue the conversation afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now, um, David Lopez, um, who's uh, talk on policy paradoxes, the case of the double-decker transit routes for cars in Mexico City. All right, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Eric, thank you so much for the, the invitation. I'm pretty happy to be here. And uh, I, I have some comments that uh, about your presentation, David, uh, that because I think they relate a lot to, to what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to leave them for the next part of the session. Maybe when we open it up. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about an infrastructure. Uh, and before um, getting to the specifics of it, I just want to put a couple of minutes of this video of a documentary uh, so that you can actually see what I'm going to talk about. All right? I'm going to put just a couple of minutes. This is a documentary called In the Pit from 2006 um, about um, tracking on a daily basis some workers from this uh, elevated highway from the construction site. And the sounds of the music are with, uh, with people speaking in the, in the documentary, so that's, that's interesting.
All right. I guess that's enough. Um, okay, so thanks a lot. I'm from Mexico, from Guadalajara. Uh, I'm doing my second year in the PhD uh, of uh, public and urban policy here at the New School. And uh, well, I'm still in full swing in my courses, so I'm not into dissertation, but I'm um, well trying to write my papers about things that I'm interested in and trying to settle the grounds for uh, getting into research proposal work. Um, so uh, before starting, I, I just want to tell you uh, where where I'm talking about where, where I'm talking from. Um, what I'm most puzzled by, and I think that it's driving my inquiry, is that uh, Mexico City is a place of incredible and even development. Uh, you can see places, geographies of the city, well served of infrastructure, um, and the the resources of uh, infrastructure policy are uh, constantly flowing through to these places. And there are other parts of the city that that are just uh, leading to great disinvestment. So that puzzles me, right? And I'm trying to understand why why this is happening. And, well, because this is a, I'm in a public, in an urban policy PhD, well, I guess at the end of it, I have to propose like a way of uh, uh, disturb that, those dynamics and, and mess a little bit with, uh, with, with infrastructure policy and the way we invest money, right? So that's where I'm talking from. Uh, and I'm writing this paper right now that I have to turn in on, two, on Wednesday. So it's great to be here and present it. And if you have some feedback, that'll be great. Um, so I'm writing this, this article about the, the, this uh, elevated highway system. And I'm looking at the, at the moment of the decision uh, of constructing it, that is um, in the year 2000, late 2000 and uh, 2002, late 2001, 2001 and 2002, um, because it was, um, okay, so the project was proposed by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who was like the, starting his term as a city major, and he was well-renowned to be from a left political party and a progressive guy. So all of a sudden, in one of his daily press conferences that he used to do every morning, he announces that he's gonna make this investment of 8,000 million pesos, which was like um, $868 million at the time, in constructing, constructing two elevated highways that were gonna run from the city um, this is like the center of the city. One of them was going to be here, and the other one was going to be here, right? In a project that will take five years in four stages with a lot of investment. So um, the project was immediately contested. Uh, and it ended up in the, in the making of a plebiscite. It, making, it ended up in a plebiscite to let um, people decide whether to construct it or not. But the road to the plebiscite is what I'm looking at because it wasn't uh, easy, that, that road. Uh, the plebiscite wasn't in the, in the map at the beginning, but the political contestation created uh, or ended up in this decision of making that, uh, that plebiscite, right? So that's what I'm looking at. Um, and in this paper, what I'm trying to do is um, discuss the kinds of uh, publics that are um, uh, involved in, in infrastructural projects, uh, but also the kinds of publics that infrastructural projects create and how they relate in the political process, how they involve in the political process to, to make these kind of infrastructural decisions, right? I guess what puzzles me is why uh, Mexico City major decided to invest in this in a highly uh, well-served zone of infrastructure in the city, and at the end of it, he got away with it, right? Even that there was a lot of political contestation. So what I'm doing here is uh, taking some theoretical frameworks from uh, the field of technopolitics and um, uh, looking at three kinds of publics. Um, First, um, in this classic approach of um, that infrastructure is designed to serve uh, a defined public, right? So projects are designed 
with some public in mind. Uh, and then there's a second approach of seeing an, the interaction between publics and how that um, ends up with uh, how, how, how infrastructure pub, uh, projects um, end up uh, explained by, by that inter interaction. But also the kind of publics that are constituted by the infrastructure. Okay, so what I'm doing here is um, asking what publics are calling to being when infrastructure is, is deployed. Uh, in this case, the, the announcement of the project became the site of contestation that created some publics that came into be and engaged in this political process. And I'm exploring the interplay between the planning and the construction of infrastructures and the gathering of publics with an accent on the mechanisms of collective choice, expert evaluation, and contestation that mediate among them. Uh, so I'm looking at the side of interconnection of infrastructure, publics, and expertise right? that uh, engage in a, I call it a technopolitical battle for the truth. Uh, so who gets to have the, 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 the truth, the, the facts, the expertise, uh, that is the one shaping the political discourse and shaping decision making in, in, in policy, right? Uh, so to do that, uh, I'm, I'm seeing at the interconnections or the entang entanglement of um, publics, infrastructure, expertise, and uh, participation. And for that, I, I did this uh, brief timeline uh, with these three streams of um, what kind of publics were involved in the, in the process, what was the kind of expertise being uh, discussed and by whom and with which claims, and what kind of participation was uh, all of it um, surrounding the, the, the project of these, uh, of these elevated highways, right? So, so what I'm gonna do in this presentation is walk through this timeline very briefly and then open it up to discussion. So, I'm gonna go first to the expertise, all right? So, when the, when the mayor of Mexico City, when Andres Manuel López Obrador uh, announced this project, he framed it in, he framed it as a strategy to improve air quality in the city, all right? So, the public that was hypothesized that was in, his, in, the, in the mind of his team when he, when he presented the project was, a, was, I guess he was thinking of inhabitants of Mexico City as a whole getting the benefits of cleaner air, right? So that was the rationale. And this could be explained because um, Mexico City had a long tradition of discussing air quality. Uh, they, they had these programs in the 90s uh, 1996, 2002, these programs are called PROAIDES. Uh, there are big efforts by federal government and a lot of actors engaging universities to create these kind of programs that uh, they usually have uh, four or five streams of actions with specific actions to improve the, the, the quality of air. And a big component of it is uh, public transit and transit uh, trends and habits in the city. Right, so that's what, that, that was the way that uh, this was framed. That's Andres Manuel the, making the announcement. But when you track um, what happened, you can see that uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador assembled a team of, uh, of experts uh, of his government to put forward um, a list of um, of reasons, of technical reasons to improve the, I mean, to, to implement the, the project of the double decker. Uh, among the arguments that you can see if you revise the documents and if you go to see the newspapers of that uh, amount of time, uh, you, you're, you're gonna find um, arguments like uh, the double decker, the, the, the elevated highway is going to have a positive impact on air quality. 
because the average speed will increase from 20 kilometers to 45 kilometers, which will save fuel and emissions. Uh, the project will contribute to decrease 5,592 tons of emissions per year from vehicles. Uh, and given the fact that there are no technologies, even uh, whether for vehicles or fuels, that allow uh, to achieve such benefits uh, at, at the cost of the project, then it, the project is cost effective. Uh, the project will allow to save 4.17 million of man hours, uh, which uh, is calculated, was calculated in 25.5 million of dollars in labor. Uh, it will save 29 million of liters of fuel. Uh, and so on and so forth. You can see a set of uh, claims in technical terms to promote the, the project, right? But at the same time, you can also see another assemblage of opposition from political parties and political actors, but also from uh, civil society. And they're also uh, making and putting forward technical arguments to battle against uh, the implementation of the project. And if you do a revision of all the claims that uh, this other assemblage of political actors set forward, you're going to find arguments like, the project does not respond to the principles of sustainability agreed so far for the metropolitan zone of Mexico Valley. Uh, the main target of governmental efforts should be public transit system not, not elevated highways. The project will increase, increase traffic jams because it fails to acknowledge the induced traffic while, uh, it fails to acknowledge the induced traffic. While the project will offer momentarily relief, the induced traffic will increase traffic, traffic levels, fuel consumption, at, and as, atmospheric pollution. Uh, a project like this requires a technical evaluation including origin destination studies, kilometers traveled by cars, modeling interactions and transit with other urban and environmental factors, current and induced uh, traffic studies, urban real estate, state redistributive and air quality impacts, uh, and so forth. So you can see also a set of technical arguments to battle against the, the other technical arguments, right? So for example, and I'm getting here into the, to the part of the analysis where I try to, to look at what publics were calling to being because of the project. Um, I can see at least three kinds of publics that were not part of the picture but emerged. Um, and they, they all had uh, legitimate claims over the project. For example, there was a, a public of experts uh, there's uh, our Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Mario Morina, who is very engaged in the air quality agenda of Mexico City. Uh, and this guy here, Gabriel, Gabriel, Gabriel Cuadri, at the time was the head of the Center for the Study of Sustainable Development, a private NGO. But then he was candidate for Mexico presidency in 2012. So it was, it was a good engagement for him. Uh, so they started to put forward arguments um, Mario Molina in technical terms about that, yeah, the, maybe the project was going to help, but it was more important to uh, invest that money in public transit. And he gave like the numbers and the, the emissions uh, related to his claims. And Gabriel Cuadri, he made uh, claims more in terms of social justice uh, in, in, in the sense that um, investing uh, 870 million of dollars in elevated highways will only benefit uh, pe wealthy people that has cars, as opposed to investing that money in other kind of infrastructure for other kind of people. So he put the discussion in terms of social justice, right, of who gets the, the money. And then uh, Areli Carrion is from another group of, um, of civil society with this sustainable transit agenda. Uh, they also uh, came into the discussion. They made a collective and a common uh, effort to bring about uh, claims of sustainable transit, technical claims regarding sustainable transit. Uh, okay, so what I've been talking about, it's, it's been like, like here, like in this moment of time, like 
the first semester of 2001, like when the project was announced. Uh, but Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the major, he reacted uh, to all this pressure uh, in the technopolitical terrain. And he did that by calling for public participation. So he did that by promoting two mechanisms of public engagement. Uh, the first of them was a telephone poll on January of 2002. So they made um, calls, telephone calls, random telephone calls to Mexico City uh, dollars. And they, got, they had a participation of 80,000 people and the yes won, right? But the, the political opposition and um, the other publics that had emerged to contest this decision uh, uh, disqualified the, the poll. So Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was, um, uh, had, to do, uh, had to go for another solution, right? So this, this, this didn't work. So what he proposed then was to make this plebiscite. All right. Um, he had a problem, though. The law at the time in Mexico City, the public participation law, didn't uh, let him to propose a plebiscite to the electoral um, uh, college. So he sort of partnered with one of those publics, with the civil society publics, so that they were the ones collecting the, net, the firms to call for the plebiscite, right? So they engaged in this process of collecting 90,000 signatures of Mexico City inhabitants to call the, the, the plebiscite, right? And that happened, they, they achieved it. And um, well, they, uh, they had the plebiscite uh, that, that happened in September of 2002. And only 6.6% 6 .6 of registered voters participated. The yes won with 66% uh, of the votes. And, um, and, the, and the elevated highways were, were constructed. Mm -hmm. OK? All right. So that's like the overall story or narrative of what happened in this case. And the conclusions that I'm grappling with and what I'm writing right now um, are, are two. Uh, first, that in this governmental rationality of the truth that in which we live today, where governments have to be right about the decisions they, they take, uh, they demonstrate that they have the truth by assemblaging these technopolitical discourses and apparatuses, right? But the paradox here is that those technopolitical means, technopolitical apparatuses, can then also be used by proponents and opponents of projects because if you have to demonstrate that you have the truth, then there's also the possibility that you might be wrong. So opponents of projects engage in the same technopolitical terrain uh, in what I'm calling here the battle for the truth, right? And the second conclusion that I'm um, grappling with is that these technopolitical means uh, can be used to, for both depoliticize or politicize a contested policy decision, right? So if I have the truth and I have the facts and I have the expertise and I have the truth here, so then that is taking the discussion out of the political terrain. But if some opponent engages in that same technopolitical terrain, then, uh, then the technopolitical mean is used to politicize. So it can be used to both politicize or depoliticize, right? And in addition, um, calling for public engagement and public participation um, in this kind of uh, contested decisions, uh, in my view, or in this case, is also a, a strategy to depoliticize a contested decision, right? So it's not the, the, the knowledge is 
out there with the people and we have to let them decide what is best for the city. But that by opening this case for a plebiscite and putting the decision in hands of, of, of the people, what, what this government this, did was depoliticize the, the, the project, the, the decision. And well, at the end, they, they, they got with it. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, great. Let me just, uh, a few remarks, and then we can kind of open this up. I mean, one thing that, that strikes me in comparing these two, these two presentations is that, um, you know, if we look at the 1940s, 50s, into the through the 60s, right, the focus is on housing above all in terms of massive projects. I mean, we do have the, the metro project, obviously, that gets initiated in the mid-60s, but you know, the first line of that doesn't open until, what, 69, and that's almost more of a 70s project in some ways, right? Um, so, so it's interesting that, you know, housing is, is really the focus of, of government um, uh, you know, infrastructure um, goals. Uh, and now that shifts. I really don't think, I, I think, right, in terms of the Mexico government really thinking about massive housing anymore um, in the way they used to, and yet, you know, transport is, is clearly the... Uh, the new set of priorities and goals. Um, a second, a second uh, point to think about is that you know there's this shift from obviously the, the authoritarianism of, of and the sort of decisions by fiat um, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, and now this process that you've you know described to us, David, uh, that's clearly about this, as you put it, this sort of you know engaging and acting of these different publics, right? And, you know, here here was the the famous rise of the civil society that, that comes about in the 1980s and 90s and, um, you know, resulting, alas, you know, in a plebiscite, right? You know, such a novel idea for, for the Mexican government to, to bring about. So, you know, we're operating in a totally transformed um, kind of environment. Uh, needless to say that, uh, according to Lopez Obrador, he's still president of the Mexico, right? I mean, you know, he lost the election. 2006 and sort of never, never let go. Um, so, but still, right? We we have we have a much more of a, a dem democratic process. Um, uh, even the 6.6 percent participation is interesting. Maybe we can get back to that and what that means. Um, but finally, a third comment is that you know one is just just struck by the Mexican government's whatever party is in power, and that in itself is an interesting thought. You know, um, government. Not the pre, but the government's capacity to just, you know, create these a massive infrastructural projects, and, and there's this real continuity there that comes out of, you know, I don't know when when we want to put that as starting. Um, you know, we can go back to you know road building and calles perhaps, but but maybe um, the, you know the, the 50s period, 60s is is as good a place as any. But in any event, you know that hasn't receded. Um, Mexico really sort of stands out in that regard, and there's been you know coherency in, in the ways in which um, these infrastructural projects um, both are able to mobilize, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about this, but local expertise, right? I mean, um, I don't know to what degree you've studied you know, the, the metro system, um, but certainly with housing, my, my understanding, you know, I mean, certainly it was local architectural knowledge, but also just, I'm thinking that at the technical level, just the sheer technical and the ways in which experts coming from the NAM and maybe the Polytechnic Institute and other places, I mean, this is really local knowledge uh, that is, you know, harnessing these. And, and I recall when the Segundo Piso went up that, you know, everyone was like, you know, they realize, you know, Mexico City is prone to earthquake, blah, blah, blah. You know, it hasn't fallen down, right? You know, it's, it's, I, I remember going on it um, uh, at the time when it just opened up, you know, a friend took me up there, and, he, and, it, and it was this sense of wonderment, right? It had just opened up. He's like, let's go up there, you know? And it was, like, really futuristic, you know, and there was this sense of, you know, you're way up high there, and there was, there was, a, there was a marble of te technology, and probably in many ways sort of equivalent to, you know, the, the metro opening up. But, but again, as you pointed out, you know, as perhaps for a, a strata of society, that same middle class, perhaps, that David, the other day was noting, um, that has access to public transport. Um, 
Just relatedly, on a side note, um, I, I was in Shanghai for a conference recently, and lo and behold, they've got a segundo piso too. And I couldn't help but wondering whether or not, you know, that idea, like where did that idea come from? And if it was, you know, Chinese, um, you know, who gave birth to this concept and the technology involved? And perhaps it was Chinese or maybe the Chinese learned it from Mexico. I don't know. Um, uh, I'd be interested in knowing, you know, where this, 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 this idea of, of, of a single piece of comes about. Um, and also, you know, you're, you're kind of, I guess I couldn't, couldn't quite grasp your, your takeaway on this. I mean, I understand you're, you're, you're kind of wrestling at making sense of this triangulation of, you know, expertise and, um, uh, and, and um, uh, how the infrastructure, infrastructure development and these publics. Um, but, you know, now we're, whatever, 15 years on, right, or 10 plus years on, and it's become a kind of a normalization, right, of Mexico City life. Um, and so how do Mexico City residents, what does it mean for Mexico City residents? How is it integrated um, into their lives? And did what aspects of these various projections, whether the projections of the AMLO crowd or the projections of the naysayers and the sustainability crowds. I mean, is there any data? Are people watching this still? Um, is there further extension of it? Um, I was in Mexico City not long ago, and you know, hey, they've still, they're still adding to the metro line, um, and you know, a whole other line there. So how does this balance out? How, does that, how has it affected the general language discourse of what um, the idea of the public transportation, sustainability um, means, you know, how has it shaped that? Has it catalyzed that dynamic of, of discussion? Um, okay, so lots of interesting things to put on the table here. Um, we can uh, open up. Yeah, but introduce you. I meant to have people go ahead and introduce themselves. My apologies, if you would. My name is Brian Gately. I was in the Peace Corps in Colombia. I work with credit unions. I lived in Bolivia for four years. And uh, Talking about uh, both housing and uh, transport infrastructure, uh, in Colombia, Medellin, second largest city, put in a um, cable car system that worked well. And then more recently, uh, Abel Morales, the head of Bolivia, did that for La Paz. And it took a very poor area up, very high level El Alto, Bolivia, it brought it into the mainstream of uh, La Paz, which is the capital. But I don't know if you could have done that by a plebiscite. Yeah. And by a plebiscite, was that binding or not binding? It was not binding, right? Well, it wasn't by law, but Lopez Obrador says that he was going to respect Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So in, uh, the way it was done in uh, Bolivia, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It, it's really changed the way. It's like putting the, like you said, uh, Eric, the uh, metro in the mm -hmm. 70s, the 60s, it's amazing change in La Paz. We go there all the time. I mean, and it's interesting too, just the, the way you describe it. I mean, it's this sense of um, trying to bridge the, the periphery right. And, right. And, and link the periphery, the, the, the highlands in this case, right, presumably, right. To, the, to the center. Right. So it's as opposed to this, you know, I mean, historically it's about walling that off, right? right. Yeah. So, you know, what does that mean, both symbolically, but in terms of the, you know, urban space and, and, and publics, you know, to get back to your point. Um, yeah, please, and, and again, just yeah, introduce I'm yourself. Yeah, I'm CUNY professor, semi-retired. You know, with a computer in your hand, what's the use? Who needs all this transportation? People are going to be doing things much more locally, standing down. I'm really thinking of a real overall political sense of what's going on here. Compared to the Americas, the uh, the highway system was set up. FDR had a plan, never did it. Oh, he didn't have enough money. Baloney. He had a civil war, and Lincoln was able to do what he did in terms of infrastructure. The point is, he saw that his, his voting base was in the cities. What are you going to suburbanize it? You get Republicans, and you get money. Forget it. I don't need it. I did it. So my thought is that there's something else going on, or might go on, or has the potential of going on about this, you know, these, these roadways, what you're really getting at. And it does have something to do with class, I think. It does have something to do with the nature of the future state 
the way we see what kind of population we're going to develop, if, if I'm correct in making those kind of... But are you saying that there are sort of external shocks or forces that, that are, are inducing these, these attempts to create infrastructural projects? Or that, that we should look for a correlation? Is that what? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying maybe they're not necessary, but when did that ever matter to politics? In fact, that's the number one rule. It doesn't matter if it's necessary. If we can get it passed and it does what it's supposed to do, it's, it's fine. So I'm a little bit suspicious of that. Because modernity, I, I don't buy that argument anymore. You know, overpass highways, modernity? Come on, we're already in an age where mm. we're. Virtual worlds. We don't need to see it. I mean, just one thought. I mean, getting back to the 2006 election, I, I remember when uh, Lopez Obrador was was the candidate of the PRD, and many assumed that he would. He was very popular as a mayor, and part of his popularity was the fact, or this was my sense of it anyway, was the fact that he had brought these incredible infrastructural developments to the city had shown that he could manage a city of, you know, 20 million, give or take, right? And this project, my impression was it was a tremendous success. I mean, they really threw it together. In like five years, this thing went up. And it didn't fall down, you know? Um, and it was free, to my knowledge, right? I don't think there are no tolls on, on this road. Yeah, not on that one. Yeah. Um, so and and he didn't win, but but the point is is that I thought that you know this was going to be his projection politically. Um, so that that's another th thought to, to bring up. Yeah. So, so it, it just, I'm sorry. Just introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Jim Biles. I'm the EO, the director of the PhD program in Earth and Environmental Sciences here. But I'm a geographer by training. I work in Mexico primarily. Um, I don't think you can have any discussion of housing in Mexico without talking about Article 4 of the Constitution, which guarantees Mexicans a right to housing. And even though the Constitution's been gutted over the past 30 years, um, that still remains, uh, it evokes, I think, uh, a sense of pride and rights among the, the Mexican people even to this day. Um, I think it's erroneous to, um, to claim that uh, Mexico does not build public housing. Every year, they build hundreds of thousands of units uh, of housing through Infonavit, which is the Workers' Housing uh, Institute. Um, what we have in these two projects, though, is a similarity that I don't think either of the presenters sort of um, highlighted. We have the privatization of the commons, in a sense, right? So housing provided by EMS and that development that you showed us was a, um, a development. It was multifamily housing. There was some sense of shared um, history, tradition, commitment uh, to the revolution and the ideals of the revolution. The building of the metro system in the 1960s was a commitment to public transportation. In both senses, what we've seen in Mexico in the past 30 to 40 years is a shift to taking public resources and orienting them towards the private. Private homes, which are built through Infonavit, and private transportation for the automobile, okay? And the constituency are neither those who occupy the decent housing or the second you know, level of the um, highway. It's the building industry. The, the biggest lobby, one of the two or three biggest lobbies in the country are home builders, and road builders. And what we have here is a case, there's a great word in Spanish that doesn't have a perfect English translation, una simulación. Okay, what we have is the building of... Well, I swing of hands. <laughs> yes, it is to a certain extent, right? I wouldn't call it public housing because that evokes a different understanding here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. of what we have in Mexico, right? It's subsidized housing, it's housing for the working class, for low-income families. Um, the construction is often publicly um, supported. But it's the sleight of hand is that you have a product, a highway or a home that is built, that is offered as being some, some tangible, meaningful result of the revolution or a political process, when in reality what you have is the transfer of public wealth to private interests, often uh, cronies of the very same government. It doesn't matter whether it's PAN, PRI, PRD, Morena, makes no difference. Let's, let's, let's um, halt questions and give you guys a chance to reflect on some of what's been thrown about. 
Well, I think th there's a general sense of what people are getting at is the kind of going at different angles in terms of the importance of of these public projects, of what is what gets at it in terms of there is um, the economic element of it, the political economy element of it, um, even just on, on one level in the 1960s, I don't have the stats in, in front of me right now, but the, the rise of the construction industry as all of this is developing um, is tremendous. There, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, then there's the, one of the things about whether it's government, called government, built housing, public housing, housing that has some um, element of the government uh, either subsidizing it or, or having architects that are designing it. Um, you know, having this kind of situation is, statistically, um, it's not housing that many people numerically until in, in Bonaby, and that's where I think you do get a broader base of people who are um, interacting with the government on some level to, to have a house. Um, but before that, um, percentage-wise, the numbers are not that uh, large a number. It's a, it's a pretty small, significant, insignificant number in terms of you're talking about percentages. But um, the, the, the sort of colossal or monumental element of what they were doing and taking over that public space and creating these uh, you know, large-scale housing projects um, it makes a very direct impact in terms of when you're talking about this constant um, discontent and feeling among people of the city is chaotic, it's collapsing, uh, there's so many problems here. It, it, it's interesting the fact that there is a notion that the state or the government should step in and do something about that. The fact that there is that demand in and of itself. Um, but so when, you, when you're creating these large-scale uh, housing units, um, it is somewhat of a strategy or a way of saying that the government is stepping in and creating um, housing for the working class, you know what I mean, and are able to project that uh, with a great deal of propaganda and fanfare, and every time these things open up, um, it's a big spectacle and a big press release and a big press thing. Um, but the, the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, or, or, or touch upon um, is uh, the fact of the shift from the public or um, opening up to the commons to a more privatized or atomized element of things. I think that there's, we see shifts in terms of political economy and more neoliberalism. I'd be curious um, if there's thoughts on the role of, uh, th this is happening in this same time when there's a strong rise in violence and crime and how that is related to uh, more privatization and atomization within public life. Um, you know, there's inequalities that exist and forms of social, spatial segregation that's being sort of implemented in this period of time. Uh, the role of violence or crime is another element when we're talking more contemporary sense of um, the loss of the commons, so to speak. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> well, um, I met some notes, I, I want to go over them uh, regarding the questions. Uh, this um, matter of the expertise uh, that you are uh, asking about, um, I remember a, a couple of anecdotes from these uh, events. Uh, one of them is that um, that um, some neighbors of uh, the near neighborhoods where the elevated highway was, was going to be built uh, organized um, a forum a public hearing uh, to speak about and to uh, make a demonstration about it. So one of the outcomes of that um, hearing was that they made a letter to the, to the city government uh, using a, a right that they had uh, in the public participation law. So they, they send it and they, they, they got a response, right? an official response, because mm -hmm. they're entitled to it. So one of the comments was that, what about the danger of earthquakes of the elevated highway? 
and the city responded the, the um, with the well, the response was that uh, after evaluating the situation, they assessed that there was no risk of uh, earthquakes because the elevated highway was going to be settled in some columns that were going to be 30 meters uh, below the ground in a tectonic plate that is not uh, in danger of earth. But I mean, the, the very technical, yeah, very technical response yeah. Yeah, yeah. to to tackle the the, yeah. the earthquake uh, yeah. comment, right? Uh, another anecdote is that uh, the city government partnered with UNAM with their engineering faculty to make um, ongoing technical support to the process, mm -hmm. so that uh, another technical response to to the attacks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by by pro proponents. Um, and well, how do, what is going on on right now? Well, this was the first uh, elevated highway, and it's not it's toll free. Uh, there's not a fee to, to use it because was that was one of the uh, promises of Lopez Obrador. But after that, uh, there were other governments that started to uh, build this kind of infrastructure by letting private firms get the, the business of it, right? So... In Mexico. In Mexico City, yeah. yeah. So firms are... Um, uh, a bit, in a bit. They participate in a bit. Mm -hmm. So competing in bits, and they get the project. And uh, now it's a very common thing that you have to pay to use them if you want to get into some parts of the city. So what, I, what I'm thinking that is going on here is that... Uh, the first infrastructure created some sort of loop of material loop back in some sort of policy diffusion, sorry, a policy feedback uh, effect. Mm -hmm. uh, the theory of policy feedback says that there are resources effects and cognitive effects, but I think that something else is going on here. I think there are material effects mm -hmm. of infrastructure. I mean, these kind of projects once deployed. And once they're well, they're going about, you know, the the the, the um, construction industry. I mean, well, isn't it Carlos Slim who owns the cement industry, right? I mean, so <laughs> exactly. you know, he's selling a lot of cement to put up these things, right? And yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, yeah. last thing that I wanted to say is that, um, yeah, um, I wanted to speak back to your presentation, David. It's um, it's uh, interesting to see how they they relate because. Um, now, the discussion in Mexico is that this housing policy of the, of the 90s, of the right to housing that, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, that he was talking about, he just left. Oh, yeah, the geographer. Yeah, but the geographer was mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, indeed, the uh, Mexican government put a lot of effort and resources into fulfilling that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that right through these institutions for uh, social housing, mm -hmm. but the downside of it were uh, how that connected with other kind of urban problems that sprawl mm -hmm. uh, created in Mexican cities, uh, one of them being sustainable transit. Mm -hmm. So there's like a connection between the housing policy and other kinds of, mm -hmm. of, um, of infrastructures. And uh, well, to the point that now social houses is in in a crisis in Mexico, and I and I do I know this for sure because I was in, in Mexico City last summer doing some research, and I was able to uh, participate a little bit with the foundation of this Infonavit, the social housing uh, uh, office. Of, yeah, so they, now they have a foundation, so they have a problem now. Um, the houses that they are selling are so far away that mm -hmm. people is abandoning them. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're getting back to the city because the cost of transactions of the city are so high mm -hmm. that there's no business for people to be there, so they are just, this, they're, they're they don't pay anymore. Yeah, they're ghost towns and mm -hmm. they're getting back to the city. Mm -hmm. And now there's their efforts by this foundation, which is a private foundation of this mm -hmm. in to go there and to make uh, community engagement processes to revitalize the neighborhoods and make them great again. Yeah. <laughs> so that people can get back. Yeah. Well, are all these infrastructures to, to try to connect the outskirts 
uh, it's being put all this money, but there's no efforts to bring employers and works great outside point. of Mexico City, because it seems point. to be a problem in Latin America. That's a great point, and I wanted to comment that on the, on the cable oh, right, so, yeah. system. Yeah, right. that, yeah that, that's exactly my point, that um, I was very cheerful of sustainable transit projects before coming here to New York <laughs> at the new school. Actually, I was working a lot of sustainable transit uh, agenda in Guadalajara, but now I, I just think just like you. I mean, uh, yeah, you can connect some parts of the city and you can lower the cost of transactions from some sectors of the population, but you don't change anything of the economic dynamics of the city, right? So nothing changes. I mean, yeah, you can put a nice infrastructure, mm -hmm. but you're not going to change mm -hmm. any structural mm -hmm. I don't know if this is at the economic level. Mm -hmm. I just have a question. Uh, I, I haven't been in Mexico City in a while, but I'm going soon. Um, what is the outcome of the uh, the double decker? How? What's the uh, reading on it? What's the extra? What's is it successful? Has it diminished air or is it pollution or increased? Or has it been a, 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 has it solved problems or created problems? I, I will. I mean, it would be it would be bold to speak for the overall outcome of it, but my sense is that um, traffic jams are there again. I mean, these um, expectations that these projections that uh, they will induce traffic, I think they fulfill. Um, they're they're swamped again in traffic, and uh, the the air quality crisis is still on, is going on, and I, I would say it's 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 even uh, more urgent now because they, they just had this tremendous emergency period of six months of a lot of uh, special uh, regulations uh, against uh, private car use due to atmospheric uh, pollution. So so no, I mean the traffic is worse. These projections of induced traffic uh, fulfilled, and the <coughs> crisis of air quality is still there. It's the kind of problem we experienced in New York City, where they say the idea if you build the if you build the baseball field, whatever they will come. You know, if you right. make the road, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. My in, in social issues, especially human rights, and all what you have been discussing is directly connected with human development. So I'm really curious, uh, David, in, in the aim of your expected conclusion, and you said the techno-political battle for the truth. Yeah. I would like to hear a little more what your expectations are and what you define expect to find in clarity of what is the, the, the core of that battle. Because for me, truth, in my understanding, suits everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not half true. If it's half true, it's not true, right? So I would like to hear a little more of sure. that. And since, because uh, the Agenda 2030 is expected to uh, be open and inclusive sure. to the rural areas. In those slums areas, I'm really concerned about that because I don't see how what is happening in Mexico will help, especially in Latin America. All right. My question was so short. Sure. Uh, there was another question over here. Did you have a question? Uh, well, yeah, I was just curious. Um, so my name is Mason Drassel. I'm a master's student in political science here at the Graduate Center. Um, but I've done research uh, in Rio de Janeiro looking at how the Olympic uh, preparations affected the Vela communities. And so I'm really, this topic is very fascinating to me in both the transportation and housing effects. But my curiosity was um, kind of, you know, for Rio, there was the whole Olympic kind of reason for all the uh, infrastructure developments that happened. But from a political stance, um, is there any sort of, I, I understand the political motivations, but is there per, in one parti uh, party in particular um, that really kind of tries to mobilize um, 
these projects to try and build up a, a momentum and kind of political uh, votes and things like that. And just like how like in, and what's the future for these projects? Are, are they going to try and connect more double decker highways in the future and kind of like the forward thinking nature of these projects? I would just add one one, one thought based upon what some of this discussion that. And, and the comment before that he said about uh, Article 4 in, of the Constitution, you know, in what ways do we see competing or overlapping discourses that are shaping these different kinds of projects? So like a discourse about um, the, the idea of public, public good or public right, so housing as a public right, you know, something that's not really part of our political discourse, right? I mean, um, uh, uh, or, and then this sort of newer language of, say, sustainability, right, as a, a, that which was not some, you know, so that's, so we had the, the example of the bicyclists, right? Um, so there's that, that kind of uh, discourse uh, shaping. Um, and, and, you know, I'm very really struck is, as you know, David, why, uh, about this idea of monumentalism and how, you know, for so many decades, right, um, government projects in Mexico in particular, but I think we can see this at different moments historically um, in different regimes uh, in Latin America and, and around the world, you know, focus on the, mon the spectacle, the monumental, um, at the expense of, you know, the, the, the minute or the micro. Um, and to what degree, you know, how does the public sort of respond to that, right? I mean, is there still a sort of a resonance and expectation of the government to do things monumentally, um, or are we seeing a shift, you know, toward the micro? Uh, you know, I know in Mexico City now they have begun to shut down certain avenues and open them up to bicyclists. Um, and, and there are these, you know, micro level efforts to create uh, a consciousness of sustainability, uh, which is, you know, rel relatively new. And yet the Green Party is just mired in, you know, fraud and absurdity in the case of Mexico. So I don't know, I'm curious, you know, trying to, you know, how these different com dis competing discourses are shaping the realm of public policy and expectations, the publics, as you so, but anyway, that's just one more point to add to the mix. Yeah. Well, to that point, and with your point, both Colombia and Bolivia have made a conscious effort to make the smaller cities and towns livable mm -hmm. so that people don't do what's happened in Mexico City or a lot of places, come to the big city. And, you know, you've got, it's incredible, 1.6 million people in Mexico City in 1940, and now it's, what is it, 20, 30 million? Mm -hmm. but for, it, it's so... Colombia hasn't had that. Bogota has grown, but not nearly as quickly, I don't think. And neither has Bolivia. So do you, my question in general is, is Mexico trying that at all? To make the smaller places people live attractive so they don't need to come to Mexico City? Mm -hmm. Which, what do you think? You mean out in the country? Yeah, the because, I mean, no, it's 80% urbanized. I just saw a headline in some, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's all people live in the cities in Mexico. Well, just quickly and, and directly to that, I would, I mean, even even prior to that, I would say, starting in the 1970s, there was a, finally there was an effort by the government to decentralize industry a little bit more in order to attract people, or at least to other cities, aside from urbanization, at least to try to um, cut the you know rapid and uncontrolled growth in Mexico City. Um, but th there's two points I just wanted to pick up on um, th that were, were being discussed. I think one interesting thing is um, to, to follow through what happens to many of these large-scale public projects or monumental projects. Um, because as you bring up the Olympics, there's sort of um, the, the intensity and the rush of the moment, and then it passes. And so with, with I don't know, in terms of Brazil, but in, in Mexico cities, there's this rush to create all of these um, sports centers and parks in 1968 when the Olympic is occurring. There's these housing for um, the athletes that's occurring. There's these large-scale public um, works that are going on. A lot of it is for 
you know, the tourists that are coming in for the media, for this sort of um, larger exposure, but um, they continue on. They, they continue to exist. They continue to serve a purpose. And the um, sports city in Mexico City is an example. It's mass, one of the largest parks, sports center parks built um, in the run up to the Olympics. Um, that sort of gets a lot of the fanfare, but this is a park that continues to exist decades after and gets utilized. And so there's um, an evolution. Does the government um, sort of neglect it? Does it go bad? You know, does it continue to be upkeep? That's one of the things about, particularly with housing, is that you can build a large-scale public work, maybe a, a monument, something of that nature, but something like housing is a, is a consistent thing where people are living in it and shaping it and repurposing it. And so because of that, um, I'm sort of putting an argument for a long, long-term scope of how these things um, get developed. The second thing with rights is that there's a, um, in the 50s and 60s, there's actually a, a conflict that we see in terms of rights. Um, on the one hand, there is this right in the Constitution for housing, particularly it's that um, industry, large-scale industry, provide housing for its workers, right? So that's one right that's existing that's getting struggled for. On the other hand, there's the right to um, communal land outside of the city, the ejidos, right? And so um, a, a lot of this expansion that we're talking about when we're talking about Mexico City, um, in the 1970s, roughly 25 to 30 percent of this of the urbanized area that gets expanded out is getting expanded out on ejido land, on federal communal land, right? So there's that clash, right, of technically people have the right to this communal land in what was then outside of the city. As the city's expanding, there's in, in so many words, a manipulation of these law, land laws and rights for the farmers who are being dislocated by the sprawl of the city. So um, there's, there, there's a clash of these rights that's existing in terms of urban space, and it's existing in a moment where the discourse of modernization is, is trumping these legal rights. And when, I, when I'm saying that, there's um, much more of a sense of uh, placing progress and material growth much more in the forefront than specific rights. Not that's not to cancel out one or the other. It's just simply when looking back in the archives, what you see much more of a uh, dominant in the discourse. Yeah, to to connect it with the kind of like the battles we have in North Dakota. Is there an issue of, of indigenous rights? in Mexico, and how did that land switch happen? I mean, was it constitutional? Did, let's say, the federal government have jurisdiction over the communities? And what's, what's the legal framework there like? Um, well, with the Ejidos, this is really outside of urbanized areas, and so the basic stipulation is that it's land that's set aside for the purposes of agriculture, not for um, residents or commercial enterprise outside of agriculture. So, so the local communities are, are uh, tenant farmers, in a sense, on federal land? Is that, is that how the, the system worked? or? More or less, some of it would say federal, some of it would say communal land, but the purposes of it is it, it should not be developed. It's set aside for, for agriculture. For purposes. farming, for the right. communities, for the local communities to sustain themselves, right. right? So, but at a certain point, much of the, you know, as at least in the 60s, Mexico City is expanding. And so um, in, this is where the laws are, really um, used selectively. Uh, in the case of, I, I know they came in late, but in the case of the, uh, the, the public housing complex I was discussing, that was a situation where by, it's not this exact phrase in Mexico, but in the US they say eminent domain, the government is allowed to take over that land for public good or public use. Um, so in those cases it, it occurs, however, in. In, in, in many of the cases where you have the, the shanty towns or informal settlements that are arising, um, there, there isn't that 
is occur that's not occurring. What is occurring is um, a strategy of basically keeping things locked up in the air, where there's people petitioning for it to go this way, it gets put through this labyrinth of court cases, um, and it's left in a gray area, at least up until the 70s when they started formalizing the land. But for at least two decades, this was a, a process where um, basically there was land law manipulation to put it in a gray zone to make it difficult to contest it through legal channels. Eventually, that does change, but it, it lays a basis for a lot of um, uh, fraud, land fraud, fraudulent land sales. But this is not far deep into the countryside and, and dealing with you know, indigenous issues in, in, in Algonquin or, or things of that nature. This is on the outskirts of the city more. Do you want to have a last thought? Can I wrap it up? Any, any final words on the future of urbanity and public transport? Here's your opportunity. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, well, yeah, I, I just want to expand on the technopolitical battle and the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, what techno political battles can we yeah. anticipate? What's the future of the Yeah, and, and I'm going to uh, put that together with this. And you're on camera, account. by the way, so you're going to. Thank you. Sorry. So I'm going to be held accountable. accountable for what I say. All right, so I think that what puzzles me is that the way I'm conceptualizing this is that uh, any, any policy field has like a um, public sphere governing it with uh, discourse and uh, agreements, and there's a public sphere uh, dominating decisions, right? And um, I guess that there's, there, there are publics, there are other kind of publics uh, with a different discourse, with a different view, trying to get into that public sphere and have an influence in that, but they're unable to, to, to get into that public sphere uh, because they don't have the truth or they're wrong, right? Because what, what the truth is, and in, in this public sphere, the very infrastructures, uh, the measurements, the, the, the criteria that we use to assess policy, and all these measurement instruments like cost-benefit analysis and so forth, uh, all those criteria are negotiated in a political domain, right? So uh, they're also contested. Uh, they can be contested. And I guess that's my explanation for the way we are investing money in the city and creating these patterns of uneven development. Uh, my hypothesis will be that this public sphere uh, is working perfectly to that kind of urban development and counter publics trying to challenge it are not able to, to accomplish it. Just to throw we thought over there so you can think about it. Maybe that fear, what you are describing, has to be connected to the fact that overpopulation in the urban areas come from the rural area. So what happened? What is the connection? Why a massive amount of people are moving into these cities and creating these conditions? And there, I, I think it's like mm -hmm. the root of what you are, has to be to policy making. Mm -hmm. So just to think about it. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you all very much for sticking around. Uh, it's fascinating conversation.